about why. I was going to start out by kind of telling you why I do this work. And it, and it was really a process of an awakening as I um, was practicing medicine and kept running into barriers to what I thought you know, kept me from practicing quality medicine. Um, I'm the first doctor in my family. I graduated top of my class in university. I graduated with honors from my medical school. I went to Johns Hopkins and I thought, great, I'm going to go out and practice quality medicine. And then I found out that insurance administrators were deciding what my patients could and couldn't have. People that had no medical training at all. And it just wasn't right. So, um, so what we have right now, there's a, another pediatrician who I really adore, Dr. Donald Berwick, and he's head of the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And he says that systems do what they're designed to do. So if we say that we have a health care system in the United States, what it's designed to do, unfortunately, is not create better health for our population. It is designed and doing very well to create more profit for the industries that are healthcare care industries. Um, the situation that we're in the United States was really never intended to become a system. It was really an accident of history. And, you know, back in the 1940s, when we saw many European nations after World War II creating healthcare systems as part of their, you know, recovery packages, at that time, the United States went in a different direction. We actually linked health insurance to employment. And that wasn't really meant to be the basis of a system. It was really a reaction to the fact that wages were frozen and employers needed another way to attract employees. In the 1980s in the United States, we took another step that put us in a, in a direction that took us away from, from really health. And that was when we started to privatize health care. And we saw the Department of Health and Human Services use public dollars to bring investors in and train them on how to take over health care. So Solomon Smith Barney and, and groups like that were learning how to make a profit off of health care. And at that, since that time, I don't have slides to show you today, but it's really dramatic um, how we see a, a real steep rise in health care costs start after that, and then a, a rise in the number of people that are uninsured. So what are the consequences of the kind of system that we have right now? Well, the United States has the, um, I guess we're distinguished as the one place that we're top in the world is the amount of money that we spend on health care. We spend more per person per year on health care than any other industrialized nation. And in many nations, we spend twice as much as what they spend. And they actually cover pretty much everybody and have better health outcomes. Um, we have a growing number of uninsured. We just saw the new numbers for the 2010 census data. Another 1 million people became uninsured last year. The year before that, it was over 4 million people that became uninsured. We've seen a drop in the number of people that are being offered insurance or can afford insurance through their employer. And we're seeing a rise in the number of people that are underinsured. So these are people that pay for their insurance premiums, but when they have a serious accident or illness, they find out that they're not able to afford the care that they need. Or they're vulnerable to bankruptcy. I mean, if you think about it, do you know of any other nation where people have to have bake sales and fundraisers when somebody gets a serious illness? It just doesn't happen. And in my neighborhood, there was a, a woman who developed cancer, and her husband had to take on a second job in order to pay her medical bills, which at that time of, of her life, really, he would have been much more useful at home with her and you know where she needed him. So these kinds of health injustices are happening in our country. And, and in many cases, we're not aware that they're health injustices because we don't see what happens in other places. Um, the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States, over 60% of personal bankruptcies, is due to medical costs. And almost 80% of the patients that go bankrupt from medical costs have health insurance. Many of them maintain their health, health insurance throughout their illness, but still went bankrupt. Um, last year alone, 29 million people used their entire life savings for health care costs. Um, and we have a growing number of people who have unmet health needs. You know, we so often hear about rationing. Well, all those other countries that have health care systems, they ration. Well, we ration in the cruelest way here. We ration care based on the ability, ability to pay. And we have self-rationing now. We have about 50% of people in the United States who don't get necessary care because of the cost. Not really a way to have a healthier population. And then 
Finally, as a result of the way things are, we're seeing really an impact on our businesses. Healthcare premiums that businesses pay have been a leading factor in the stagnation of wages. You know, we see our unions fight to maintain their health benefits, but any raise they get is eaten up by increased cost sharing for their health premiums. Um, we see that our competitiveness on the global market is hurt. We see you know, our, our car industry moving into other countries that have universal health care systems to manufacture their cars because they were spending $1,500 per vehicle on health insurance. More than they spent on steel was spent on health insurance. And it really kills our entrepreneurial spirit because people are jumped, tied to their jobs. They worry that if they leave their job to go and start a new business, they won't be able to afford health insurance premiums, or they might lose their insurance because they can't, you know, they have a pre-existing condition and they can't get another insurance. So, um, so it's it's really harming us in many ways. The situation that we're in right now, and that's what drives me to do this work. Now, we passed the Affordable Care Act last year. And some people say, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I can tell you that there's really arguments on both sides. So I don't have the wisdom to tell you if it's a good thing or a bad thing. But I can tell you that it didn't solve our problems. I can tell you that when it's fully implemented in 2019, they anticipate that we'll still have half the number of people that are uninsured remaining uninsured. That's tens of millions of people remaining uninsured. It's going to increase our health care costs through added bureaucracy of the health insurance exchanges, through having to enforce a health insurance mandate, and through having to regulate insurance companies and follow up and try to make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be um, doing, which in the state of Maryland we've had a very hard time with that. Um, it's actually going to continue to increase the number of underinsured people. As more and more people are pushed into these health insurance exchanges, they're going to have to, as, because they didn't control the cost of health insurance premiums, we're going to see people buying the lower, lower benefit plans, and that's going to leave them vulnerable when they have a serious problem. And while um, we anticipate that we will also continue to see a decline in employer-sponsored insurance, because there was a report in a, in a business journal where they, they were pretty honest. They said, well, no business wants to be the first one to dump employer-sponsored health insurance, but everybody wants to be second. <laughs> so, you know, we, you know, as a doctor, you know, we try to be scientific and we look at, you know, studies and what works and what doesn't. We now have tens or tens of years, many decades of experience with this current health system, and the evidence is completely clear. You know, it's too expensive and it leaves people out, and it's not improving the health of our population. I didn't mention our health outcomes. I could go on and on about how our health. How health outcomes are. But I think one study sums it up really well. They looked at 19 industrialized nations that they could compare, and that if each of these nations functioned as well as the top three nations, which are Japan, <coughs> France, Japan, and Australia, they found that the United States did the worst in the number of preventable deaths, that over 100,000 people per year would not have died if we had a top performing health system. Now, in the United States, we're so often trying to be the best. Why aren't we trying to be the best when it comes to health care? So, what is single payer? What do I advocate for? Um, I came to this because as I was trying to figure out what was going on, I looked at what had been tried, and I found that we'd been trying all these little partial solutions, like we'll, we'll give a little tax break here, or we'll expand a little Medicaid there. But none of these solutions was moving us forward. In fact, we continued to fall behind. Um, so that's when I learned about Physicians for National Health Program, and it just made sense. It's based on the evidence of what works. It's based on traditional Medicare, which has worked very well. It has flaws, that's why we call it improved Medicare. But it, it has lifted seniors out of poverty, poverty. It has improved their health status. When people become turn 65 and go on to Medicare, their health improves. Um, so single payer basically does two things. It creates a health system that's based on health. Um, sounds simple, right? So um, we start taking our health resources and looking at our needs and determining What's the best way to use those resources? And it allows us to use our health dollars in the most efficient way. Um, what I didn't mention is that part of the reason our health care costs are so expensive is because we have huge administrative costs. A third of our health care dollar goes to marketing <coughs> and administration. And these are things that have nothing to do with health. Traditional Medicare spends 3% on its administrative costs. So 
33% we found that we would save about 400 billion dollars a year if we went to using a single publicly financed fund for our health care and the other thing that insurance companies do which is, is a problem is they cherry pick have you guys heard of that term they, they try to only cover the healthy people and then people who have actual health problems often get put into our public programs so what um, single payer is is it's a, a single system that everybody's in from the time that you're born until the time that you die. It makes a lot of sense because when you want, when you have to restrict people and decide who's eligible for what, who's eligible for this, it's really expensive to do that. A lot of time and energy is wasted um, in, in trying to, to determine that. A single payer system would be fair, fairly financed. Um, the United States is ranked 54th in the world for fairness and financing of health care. They're very regressive, so if you look at someone's income, the lower their income is, the more they're paying it as a proportion on health care. It's comprehensive. We think that all necessary health should be covered, and we include vision and dental and mental health and long-term and prescription. <laughs> Um, it's simple. You know, right now, trying to use the system that we have is very frustrating for patients, figuring out where you can go and what you know, treatment you can have. It's also very frustrating for health professionals, so we have to spend a lot of time dealing with paperwork, dealing with authorizations, and that's time taken away from our patients. And that was really the last straw for me, when I was told that I had to spend less time with my patients, and that if they had a second problem, I had to tell them to reschedule to come back to talk about the second problem. So I'm going to tell a parent, you have to go take off work, take your child out of school, and worry for another week so you can come back and talk to me about it. That just wasn't acceptable at all to me. Um, so it's simple. It's one set of rules. And it's rules that we're aware of. Like right now with the insurance companies, their rules are all different and they change arbitrarily. And it's really hard to keep up with them. Um, a single payer system gives us choice. We heard during the health debate, President Obama kept getting up and saying, Americans want their choice of health insurance. Americans don't want their choice of health insurance. They want their choice of doctor. They want their choice of treatment. And those are the things that private health insurance restrict through their networks and through their authorization processes. So this gives you the choice to go where you want to go for health care. And if you're traveling around the country and you have a health problem, you don't have to worry that you're out of network. You can get care there. Um, it's, it creates the kind of competition we actually want to see, which is where health professionals are competing to be the best quality, so people want to come and see them. Um, that's not necessarily happening right now. A single-payer system would allow us to, to really focus on preventative care, but also, I think, timely care, which is hugely important. We have study after study that shows that when you have a copay or a deductible and you make a financial decision about whether to seek care, that people often avoid or delay getting care that they need. And that and it actually crosses all socioeconomic status levels. So it's not, it's, you know, everybody, nobody's really good at determining what care is necessary and what care is not. So we want to remove those barriers and then under a single payer system, we would pay through our taxes but we would not have to worry about co-pays and deductibles. It would create a system that we can go and use. It's like a beautiful thing. And um, the other two things about it is that it would be transparent because it's publicly financed, and it would be accountable to the people. These are really important.